let's call up Amy Jensen, who is the CFO and COO for the Water Council. Who you? Good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to introduce our speaker today, Dean Amhaus. It has now been over seven years that I have worked with Dean at the Water Council under his leadership as the organization's president and CEO. We've known each other much longer thanks to our past lives connected to the arts, and I am very happy to call him a friend. Dean's career has been quite varied with his combined experience making him uniquely qualified to create and lead the Water Council. During the 1980s, he was in Washington, D.C., working in government relations, events management, and corporate fundraising. He returned to Wisconsin in the early 90s, serving in a variety of roles in Madison, including executive director of the Wisconsin Arts Board, executive director of the Wisconsin Sesquicentennial Commission, and as president of Wisconsin Forward. In 2001, he took over as president of Spirit of Milwaukee, focused on promoting residents to the tremendous attributes and assets of the city and its seven surrounding counties. It was through this work that the idea of the Water Council was born, springing from the realization that water is one of our greatest and increasingly most valuable assets, not just in terms of the quantity and quality we are fortunate to have available to us here, but also its economic impact from our cluster water technology companies and as a significant area of study for our academic institutions. And now, without stealing his further thunder about the Water Council, please welcome Dean Amhouse. Thank you very much, Amy. I uh, was thinking when we got connected, well, we kind of connected a long time ago with Amy, but I remember, I think it was one of my last times in Rotary that I was here and Amy joined me and she had just started with the, the Water Council and she had to talk to somebody about what it was. And it was interesting, she was probably like a week on the job and she had to describe, I'm now working at the Water Council and just you know going through all of the things that were happening. So uh, it's been great to be able to work with her over the past seven years in the organization to see Joanne. Uh, Anton as well, we were just commenting 15 years ago, probably um, a lot, gray, lot less gray hair um, at that time, but she was with Senator Cole and she and uh, Julian Taylor and I got together and said, we've got this idea. There's a group of volunteers that want to coalesce what we have here around water technology and we think we may have something. And it's been interesting to see the evolution of us as an organization and where we've grown, but also where Milwaukee has changed over that period of time as well. So I'm really honored to, to be here, to be with you. And you know, Mary McCormick said when she saw this slide, she goes, is this a slide from last week? Uh, so I guess this is part two to last week. Um, and I am starting way, way, way far out. Uh, and the reason why I do this is I look at this, and we it's a beautiful picture, I mean, to be able to see what the Webb Telescope has been able to discover. And of course, one of the things that's always gnawing at us is like, is there somebody out there? Is there somebody out there? It's always that question. But, you know, what makes it possible if there is somebody out there? And when we started the Water Council roughly 15 years ago, and I'm actually taking some slides from what I had done back then. And one of the slides was this one. And so I'm sort of pulling back from this far, far universe to getting a little bit closer. So this is Mars. And of course, we're exploring Mars. And what, what are we trying to find? We're not necessarily trying to find if there is life there, but what we want to do is to find, is there water? Because if there is water, there may be a possibility that there is life. So it's the most essential thing that as we start looking for other planets as close as Mars and all beyond that, we're always trying to find, is there water out there? Coming back a little bit closer to this world, uh, this was a slide I used to show. This is uh, the Aral Sea uh, in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. 
Uh, this was when it had water. This is what it changed from 1989 to 2014. A matter of 25 years, it literally went away because of an overuse by irrigation uh, by farmers, and it was left to this. And here's another image of this is what it looked like, and it was still does. And it's interesting is that when I did this presentation 15, 10 years ago, it was always one of those things of like, well, that's over there. That's out there. That's not here at all. That's in other places, in India, in Africa, in other locations. Well, it's getting a lot closer. So I'm going to get a little bit closer. So this is a picture of, obviously, Hoover Dam. And you can see you know, the water being held back that exists to create Lake Mead, you know, beautiful site, 2001. This is a picture of, from 1983. And you can see the change. The picture in 1983 where the water is literally flowing over and now it's barely even up to where you can see it, just in a matter of a few years. And here's another picture of going back up to from 2000 to 2022, the change that's taken place uh, in Lake Mead. Very, very dramatic. Now that was over a 22 year period of time. It's getting a lot more intense in the last even year so just as an example, there was uh, a story that was written recently about the uh, Hemingway Harbor launch ramp that is part of the National Park Service. And in 2018 to 2021, they were starting to lay out markers of how far the water was decreasing. And it took you 24 paces to go from 19 or 2018 to 2021 to get to that point how the water had de decreased. In a matter of one year, add on 250 paces, the water is just going away that much faster to so such a serious situation that even last this last spring, the Bureau of Reclamation had to make some really tough decisions on what they were going to do with the water that they had. Because choices are going to have to be made. Is it going to be used for agriculture? Is it going to be used for electricity? Is it going to be used for people to be able to drink and to be able to, to survive with that? And if they hadn't done that, it was a really likelihood there was a 25% chance that Hoover Dam may not produce enough energy this year for almost 6 million people and households uh, and businesses uh, in that uh, larger area. So it's something that, you know, we think about someplace else, but it is getting much, much more closely, you know, here in this area. Here's an example of Lake Powell in Utah from June 2021 to now 2022. Just a few months, it's gone. And so this is what we have to deal with and address. And it's interesting is that in June 2020, the governor of Utah put out a message to his citizens in Utah and said, we need to pray for rain. Uh, a year ago, farmers in Arizona were hoping that it might rain. We have to do much, much more than hope and prayer to be able to address the issues that are really, really before us as well. I would have never have imagined to see these kind of articles that are occurring just over the weekend. London may have to have cause a drought because of the water issues that are there. On the other extreme, Death Valley had a flood over the weekend. Just the remarkable changes that are going on in such a fast-paced period of time. Headlines that I never would have expected to see at all. We are very, very fortunate that literally, you know, just to the east of us, we've got this big, huge body of water. And so... We are very fortunate to be able to have that, but we also really need to recognize that um, what we have here is very, very unique. And I know people have brought people you know, from visitors from around the world, and they just are amazed at this sea of water and fresh water that exists. But we have to not take this for granted. And the reason why is, as an example, this is a picture of two aquifers. This is the Central Valley of California and the Ogallala Aquifer. Um, 
that really is starting to dry up in terms of the groundwater. And so one of the reasons why I'm going to talk to you about this is that 20% of the world's grain crop come from these two areas. 40% of our nation's beef production comes from there. 40% of the vegetables, nuts, and fruits consumed by the United States comes from these two areas. And the water is drying up, up more and more and more. And so it impacts all of us on what we eat and what we're able to consume. And it's also the power of you know, association with um, creating the businesses that exist out there. It impacts upon those communities as their tax base, the jobs that are produced, and the, uh, the impact on hospitals and schools as well. Now, not everything is all bleak. There are solutions that are out there, and that really comes back to what's going on here in Milwaukee. And to stick with sort of that uh, beverage side of things, when we looked at the Water Council, we were starting to get going as an organization, it really was rooted in the fact that we had a beer industry that was here in existence. And that beer industry really was the roots of what's now called the Water Council and the water technology cluster that exists here in this region as well. And these are companies that started out like Badger Meter. Uh, that company has evolved over a period of time to now, you know, from the water meters that existed to ones that are very, very sophisticated and being able to measure all kinds of uh, uh, flows from the Keurig machines in your coffee makers are, uh, there's a badger meter, little meter in that system to big, huge uh, oil systems as well. Or a company like this, who was making car frames, uh, A.O. Smith Corporation, which now makes water heaters, and one of the largest in the world, and water filter systems as well. And what we found as we were starting to go with the Water Council there were 240 water technology companies in this region. And I remember going to Joanne Anton and said, we think we've got something here that's very unique for this region. That when we looked across the Great Lakes, look across the United States, look across the world, this was the highest concentration of water technology companies that exists anywhere in the world. It's right here. And it goes back to that brewing industry. So how do we take what we've got here and to be able to move it and advance it as further as well. And one of the things that we recognized was that we needed to be able to develop more water technology companies and to be able to start up the new ones and to be able to help the large ones to be able to grow and develop. So our job, really what we do as an organization, is really being able to convene, connect, and showcase. And it is something that we do in day in and day out and really have now become two different platforms as an organization. The first is around innovation. It's about finding the new technologies that can be created here and be deployed, not only in the United States, but across the entire world. So to be able to make water accessible, to be able to make, uh, to treat wastewater so that we can uh, address uh, uh, sanitation issues as well. And we do that through a number of different ways. We've got a startup program we call the Brew, appropriately, business, research, entrepreneurship, and water, to be able to take the global companies that exist and to be able to bring them here. And so this last year, our cohort consisted of 10 companies that went through our accelerator program, eight of those from around the world, uh, two of them from the United States as well. We've got a tech challenge program to be able to go out and find the new technologies that our big sponsors are looking for to come up with new solutions. But the other thing that we do is we pilot new technologies as well to be able to say, let's try it here and see if it can work. And I'm gonna give you an example of how we communicate, connect, and showcase. So you all might be familiar with this facility. Uh, this is the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. And this is their wastewater treatment facility. And if you haven't had a chance, to tour this facility, I would really encourage you to do this. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, I just talked with a couple of people yesterday and introduced, introduced them to a great product called Melorganite. If anybody has used Melorganite, I will sell you. It is fantastic. Uh, I use it on my plants and they love Melorganite. And it's way, uh, made from MMSD as well. So January of 2021, we were working with the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, 
And we held an event, a virtual event, like everything was going on at that time, with the U.S. Embassy in Seoul, Korea. We worked with the U.S. Department of Commerce. And we were simply trying to do a showcase of what was going on here within this region and talking to you know, Korean companies to say, hey, you might want to do some business here in Wisconsin. And from that event, we got a call from a company that had a technology that was quite interesting, very, very novel. And we introduced it to Kevin Schaefer, who runs the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. And we said, listen, we, we think you might have something here. Would you be interested in piloting this technology in the United States? He was very, very interested in it. They conducted a uh, sort of the first phase of it last year, very successful, went on to a second phase. And what it does is it takes what would typically happen in this facility and saves time and space. So imagine that space right there and doing everything that you would want to be able to do in a quarter of the size. So you reduce it quite significantly and also, it typically takes about an hour to go through the system of being able to clean water. They can do it in six minutes. So the rapid speed of six minutes to be able to treat wastewater, this really impacts upon stormwater issues that we have here, not only in, in our area, but also in other areas. So you're reducing the size and you're also making it faster. Plus, the third thing, how about if you cover it all up and make a park out of it. And that's in fact what they have done in Seoul, Korea. So this is sort of the image of what it could look like. So underneath that facility or what you see is a park is actually a wastewater treatment facility. And this is the start of that first phase of that. That is what the technology, the advancements that are going on around the world that have that potential that give us a sense of hope that while there are challenges that are out there, there are multiple technologies that are coming up, developments and solutions that can really be novel to be able to speed up the treatment of water and to do it in a very appealing fashion as well. So that's a great demonstration of one of many aspects of things. I, I met a new company recently, uh, desalination. We think about that as a, a solution that could solve all these water problems. The problem with desalination is that the huge amount of energy required, and in this time when we're trying to address climate change, we don't want to create more energy at the same time that we're trying to produce water. This is a company that's come up with a new technology. It actually uses no energy at all to desalinate water. It takes its system and puts it out in an ocean, uses the wave motion to create the needed energy to desalinate water. These are the technologies that are coming out uh, of these new innovators across the world. So I said earlier why we should pay attention, you know, for us here in Milwaukee. And it's because of the food that we eat here. We're very fortunate uh, to be able to have that. We've got to pay attention to what's going on in other parts of the world. But it's not only the food that we eat, but it's the drugs that we need. It's the computer chips that we use in our computers. It's the cars that we drive. All of these manufacturers require a huge amount of water. So while we think about water as something that's going on elsewhere, it impacts our daily lives through the food that we drink, through the, through the companies that we may you know, manage as well. And so this leads me to my second part of really where the water councils evolved. And it's a journey that started about seven years ago when we became part of what's called the Alliance for Water Stewardship. They had developed international water standards uh, to be able to help companies. And these are all kinds of companies to be able to uh, look at their water usage through their whole process as well. It was great. It's a great standard that exists. It's a company or a site by site by site. But what we saw was two years ago that there was a growing change that was going on with climate change. Things were happening very, very fast. And there was also a surge of interest by investors, by employees, and by customers that were saying more companies need to do a better job around water management as well. And there was a greater realization that there was a big risk. And something that you probably may have heard more recently 
things around environmental social governance, ESG. And it was starting to get a lot of attention with businesses, but when they started looking at the environmental issues, most of that was all focused around carbon, carbon, carbon. Very, very important issue that exists. They, had no, they knew water was coming, but they didn't know what to do and where to go with it and how to manage it. Because frankly, carbon and energy are an easy issue to address. Carbon issues that are existing here in Milwaukee are the same things that are going to happen in Delhi or in Berlin. But the water issues here are different than they are in Phoenix and frankly different than they are in Waukesha as well. And so you have to look at it locally. And so what we did was we created a program that works with companies to be able to address and manage their water issues and look at it from the entire enterprise. So you as business leaders, this is something that I would encourage you to look at within your own operations. And you may say, you know, we're operating here in Milwaukee but where are your suppliers? Where are your suppliers operating and where are they using their water? Because that could be at risk in terms of your own operations or your own facilities. And so there is a process that is out there that being able to help these companies to be able to manage their water stewardship, to manage their water stewardship journey and to be able to address it in a clear, concise fashion. And the most important thing at the end is that there's a third party verification that says, this is a program that's working, they are doing a good job. And I'm very fortunate to say is that what we've now created is a seal uh, called WAVE, the Water Stewardship Verification, a third party that can come in and endorse these companies. And we've started to add more and more companies to this process. I'm pleased that we worked with the Low Group and. Ben's here from there, and Jody was working with us on how we created this, this image as well as our overall communications program for WAVE. And I would encourage as business leaders to look at it, consider it as you work with your own operations as well. So in closing, this is where Milwaukee is, where water works. It is an important part that we play to find the solutions through the technologies that exist here and elsewhere, and to be able to link them with the water users, the water businesses that are operating across the entire world. And I'm gonna steal a line from one person, Gary White, who is uh, the CEO of a group called water.org. And he says, in the midst of climate change, water is the canary in the coal mine, because it is something that we are seeing and experiencing every single day, and it's now becoming headline news, whether it's too much water, it's happening in Kentucky, or places like Michigan or St. Louis, or not enough water, or the water quality. It is something that is important to us no matter where we live, because it's our food where we, that we eat, it's our businesses to be able to keep our you know, operations going as well. So I encourage you to join the wave and be a part of our journey in water stewardship. Thank you very much. Welcome, any questions if anybody has anything? Thank you, Dean. It's really very exciting to see what is being done. I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about the partnership with the local um, higher ed organizations. I think there's some programs going on in that realm. We do. We work very closely with higher education, both at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, Marquette University, MSOE as well, because that's the new talent base as well uh, that's coming in. So we've got programs, not only with the School of Fresh Water Sciences, but also with the engineering programs. And I think that's one thing that, you know, oftentimes we, we miss is thinking about how these uh, engineers are coming up with the new gadgets, the new technologies. Um, and so we work with them, but I'm also really excited to be able to say is that we are starting to expand ourselves. And um, this is leading us to be start working more with Madison and, and other places. And so there is a program going on right now where Amy is actually writing a proposal with, uh, to the National Science Foundation under what they call a regional innovation engine. 
and when we start looking at the impact on environmental issues, is being able to provide a resiliency for manufacturers and utilities. And so we're teaming up with Wisconsin Technology Council, University of Wisconsin in Madison, Milwaukee, MSOE, uh, as well as other local groups to be able to develop that new talent base to be able to get into those water technologies as, as, as well. So the universities are key to this uh, whole component as a, as a cluster. Yes, sir. Awesome topic. But a couple of days ago, and you probably know quite a bit about this, I'd love your comment. They were saying that the consortium of Western states are trying to get permission to pump water from the Mississippi in great quantities through pipelines out to bail them out of some of their poor planning so they can still have green golf courses. And the counter to that is that the Mississippi could get low enough the barges can't move. 40% of our grain moves out there. And the invasive species could go through the pipelines. It was a fascinating point, counterpoint. You must know quite a bit about that. Could you comment? Yes, this is an interesting thing. Um, so this has been talked about. Um, it was actually proposed several years ago by somebody in Las Vegas who said, listen, we have an answer for in the spring when it uh, floods in the Mississippi. We'll take that water off your hands. We'll just pipe that out of the Mississippi and we'll move it over to uh, Las Vegas. Um, they're getting more and more desperate right now. I think it's going to be it's extremely expensive to be able to do this and to be able to move it. But desperate times could cause that in terms of action. Um, there's also been questions about the Great Lakes Compact because there exists right now is you can't be pumping water out of the Great Lakes. And so there is a law that's in place right now. I do question, uh, I think we, it's something that we as citizens of this region have to do our ever most effort to be able to maintain that because as population, populations shift to other parts of the country and their political base, I would not be surprised if there are people who would say, let's open up that compact and let's revisit that because we need to be able to grow and develop uh, we are actually holding our Water Leaders Summit in October, and we've asked the question, and we're going to do a panel on this, is how long can places like that continue to grow and develop, and where does it become a breaking point? So we've got somebody coming in from Phoenix who used to actually be with the water utility who claims that they have plenty of water, plenty of water to keep on growing, growing, growing. And when I showed you that picture of that chip manufacturer, they are putting up more facilities to build chip, uh, computer chips in Phoenix. They use a huge amount of water. When is the breaking point? But then we've also got somebody from Colorado who's gonna be there and say, we can't keep on growing. We can't continue to do this. There's gotta be a moratorium. And there are actually communities in Utah that have stopped building permits because they don't have enough water to be able to do that. But it's gonna get to that point is how far does it go to the point where desperation and people start literally trying to move icebergs, and there has been talk about that, uh, to being able to tap into the Mississippi River and to be able to pull the water out because it creates a lot of other issues. Um, there's more and more conversations about what they call climate refugees that are leaving West Coast to come to the Great Lakes because of water, uh, uh, fire issues, and so on. Yes. Hi, Dean. <clears throat> Thanks for, for your presentation. And you almost, you almost started on my question. My question is about climate refugees. Um, and as we know that, whereas the uh, um, more powerful and well-to-do countries um, are able to put this type of funding into this kind of technology, it's a real problem for a lot of countries in the world where, you know, whether dysfunctional governments or, um, or they just don't have that, and the potential of real issues coming as a result um, because of these climate refugees. It's, it's so important um, to understand it is a human issue that is really, really important that we've got to be able to address. We've got to be able to provide the water to people. We've got to be able to provide them sanitation 
Um, I, I remember back, uh, this was several years ago, uh, talking to a, a major international foundation that wanted to come in to some really developing areas and they wanted to build schools and provide books, you know, for the children that are there. And I said to them, listen, you know, just wait on that. Provide them water. If you can provide them water so that these young girls don't have to spend eight to 10 hours a day of moving water, if they had the time to simply go to school, you will have done so much more and have a bigger impact on this from the simple act of not having those girls and women having to do that walking because it's a hard, hard day, but it's also a really high risk in terms of their safety. But it also, that then feeds into a security issue because if you have a destabilization around water, you destabilize economy, you destabilize communities as well. And so we are actually now working, and we just announced this about two months ago, we're working with the U.S. Army Reserve to create a special unit of reserve officers that are water specialists. I'll use this as a quick example. Have you ever seen the movie called The Monuments Men? This was George Clooney, did this a few years ago. The Army had created a special unit during World War II to go and find the artwork that had been stolen by the Nazis. Uh, after World War II, that unit was disbanded, but they started it up again when we went into Iraq and Afghanistan, and they worked with the Smithsonian. So there are reserve officers who are curators, who are architects, who are working with the Army to be able to address you know, challenges out there. They're now doing this with water. And so we are actually going out and recruiting water professionals to be able to take their skills from their day job and apply it to places around the world as well as here. And so we've gotten our first uh, individual, the company called Xylem. Um, they're moving to Washington, D.C. And so one of their senior executives is now called Major Al Cho. Uh, and he's part of the reserve on their special water unit. Water level in Lake Michigan, which seems to have been rising a lot over the years, maybe has tapered off, but obviously has a, a big effect on bluffs and on recreational around the lake. But does the level of the lake have a lot, a, a lot of effect on the quality of the water and of the environmental health of the lake for fish life? Well, now you're going to get more technical on me. Uh, remember, I started out as an arts background, as Amy said. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a balance to this. I, you know, I think it's, it's not so much the height, I mean, and the depth of the water issues. I mean, there's other things that are impacting upon it as well. And so you get into, you know, the, the invasive species and it's the, the quality. You know, that's the thing that we're running into is phosphorus issues. Um, that's having a much more detrimental impact, which then impacts upon, you know, the, the, um, the fish and the plant life as well. So I wouldn't say necessarily the height, it's that quality issue, which gets into fertilizers. Um, and that is a big contributor to that and the runoff that exists and goes into those, um, you know, the lakes as well. Any other questions? Thank you very much for allowing me to be with you.